And Father, we do thank you for your word. Your word is a light unto our feet. You, Lord, lead us by your word and you speak to us by your word. And so we ask you to send your Holy Spirit once more upon us, Lord, so that our, not only our words but our hearts might be open to your word. We thank you, Father. In your Son's name we pray. So this morning I wanted to particularly, I felt I should uh, speak to all of us in relation to things that we have like ailments that we just take for granted. So for example, if I have allergies, then I think, oh, well, I'll just deal with those with Pseudo, you know, with uh, Zyrtec or something else. So it's not that I'm not addressing big things. We always address, we pray for people. We've seen people healed from cancer here. We've seen people healed of many things. So it's not that we don't want to pray for big things. But this talk is for each one of us. Because each one of us has something that's not functioning as it should function. And rather than accepting it, and saying, well, that's just how it is. I'll, you know, deal with it. I believe the Lord wants us to um, look to him and ask him to heal us. Because too many of us, I know, you accept things like allergies, asthma, headaches, mild pain, sleep, sleep conditions as normal. Well, we'll just deal with them. But it's not normal. They're part of the fall. And God wants us to live a life. He wants us to know that he has the power. And just by attending church doesn't mean that you've dealt with all the problems. And I've got a very good example in Scripture here. If we can turn to Mark chapter 1. Um, verse 21, and I'll read from the New English Version because the other one, the Jerusalem one, they don't have it on the overhead. So I'll read from that one. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. That's obviously Jesus. And they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one who had authority, unlike the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, that is, he rebuked the demon, not the person, be silent and come out of him. An unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him and all were amazed. So they, were, they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his, frame, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Now, I'm not going to speak about evil spirits, although this can be part of it as well. But what I want to stress this morning is the fact that this man was in the synagogue for many years probably. Probably he had lifelong membership. Um, he was there a long time. He was there every, every Saturday. He was a good and faithful servant in that sense. But there were things in him that weren't right. And Jesus comes on the scene and because of Jesus' presence, that which was in him had to manifest, had to uh, exp reveal itself. And so Jesus walks into this place and immediately this 
evil spirit, which was in this man probably for a long time. We don't know. We're guessing. But we, we would assume that he was a, a, a regular attendee. And all of a sudden, after all that time of this guy going to the synagogue, he, Jesus rolls up and something happens and he gets delivered. The reason, of course, that he was delivered then and not before was because it was clear that Jesus had authority. Jesus had authority. And, you know, I'm here today because many years ago I questioned this fact because I, well, I was a, a Christian, I was going to church, but I, I was questioning the fact that people had no power to overcome what they were supposed to overcome, okay? So, for example, if a person had an issue with anger, you know, it was, you were taught that it was wrong and it's right from the Scriptures and, and we know that it, there can even be, if a person yields to anger a lot, there can even be a fortification of a spirit and they lose control completely. They don't have control over anger. But there wasn't... I, 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 I didn't hear anyone tell me how to really overcome these things and how to get victory over these things, whatever it was. Uh, mainly, I suppose, the, the reason was that, that because, uh, you know, I, I, of the lack of understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, many Christians lacked authority. They lacked authority. See, the difference between Jesus, when Jesus was teaching, the scribes and the Pharisees taught also. It says there. See, they said he's not like the scribes. Jesus taught very closely what the Pharisees taught. There was little difference actually in the theology. The application and hypocrisy were other issues. But the actual fact of the theology, Jesus was very close to what the Pharisees thought. But Jesus, the difference was that Jesus thought with authority. When he spoke, the Holy Spirit was able to touch people's hearts and bring change. And Jesus was able to help people and deal with their problems and deal with their current situations. In this, in this man's case, he, was, um, he had an unclean spirit. Okay, not all of them, not all the people in the synagogue, it would seem, had unclean spirits. But uh, this man did. They might have had some other problems. You see, so we could come to, to church, we could go to church for 50 years and we could still not have dealt with certain issues in our lives and they still hold us captive every day. So today... The aim is to try to, to bring that to your notice and perhaps instead of accepting something that you've accepted, you don't think it's serious, or I, I won't bother with that or I'll just use medication, perhaps the Lord wants to heal you or deliver you or set you free from whatever that is. Brothers and sisters, you know, we... Um, how can I say this? I've heard some stories this week and there's Neil shared a story about Shane Bolts, about his back and correct me if I got all the facts wrong because I left my sheet at home, the one I had written my notes on. But apparently, um, it was it close to 300 times, is that correct? Yeah. 300 times. He had prayer for healing. He had a very bad back. Now, this guy's a big prophetic guy. He had a bad back and he had prayers for his back 300 times and he wasn't healed. 300 times. But he persisted and one day somebody had a word of knowledge and he had prayers and his back was healed. See, sometimes we said, well, I had prayer last week or... 
I went to the healing rooms or whatever and I wasn't healed, so I'll forget about it. If we don't have persistence, we won't get healed. Um, another story is of John Wimber. I think he prayed at least a thousand times for healing before anyone was healed. See, we, we give in so quickly in the West. We give in. If, if the coffee's not ready in two minutes, we just give up. <laughs> you know, when you hear the stories of the persecuted church, I heard a story about um, a Russian, a, 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 a Romanian Orthodox priest who was imprisoned in Romania under Ceausescu. And um, he was treated very badly. In fact, one time they got him, they put him in, uh, in jail for 15 months in solitary confinement. He only had a half an hour a day out and he, 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 he was in there so long that he almost forgot how to speak his language because not even the guards would speak to him. And then the government wanted to get rid of him and, of course, they don't like to do to kill people if they can get away with it in those circumstances because it looks, if the word gets out, it looks bad on them. So they put two criminals in with him so they could kill him. One of them had been a murderer nine times and the other one had um, killed his mother, I think, something like that. It was bad. And they went in there and they gave this man hell. I won't repeat some of the stuff because if I repeat it, it would make you sick. It would make me sick. I may not be able to finish here. It was so bad. But all this, Rush, this Romanian Orthodox priest would do, would love them. And every day, doesn't matter how hard he was, how hard it was, he would kneel and pray for an hour. That's for us who, who won't even pray five minutes in the West. In those awful circumstances, he would kneel and he would pray for an hour. And this was going on for months, I think about four months. And one day he was kneeling down and praying and he noticed that these two men were, were kneeling beside him and they were weeping and they, 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 the conviction of God was on them so strongly that they repented and they told him what they were there for. They told him um, everything that you know, they, what, what they were about and what they had done. And um, they said, how, how could you love us when we did such horrible things? He said, it, it wasn't me, it was the love of God in me that was loving you. I could not love you, but it was the love of God. And today we had, a, when we're worshipping, it was about the love of God. It was the love of God in me, he said. And you know what happened to those poor guys that, um, they, within, that, within that day, they removed them and they were never heard of again. The, the positive side, they met the Lord before they were taken. Now, th this is a story because we, we, it's good to hear these stories because we live in a, we live in a bubble most of the time. We don't, we're not living in the reality of what the world is living in. You, you know, you're a blessed... <laughs> We're blessed people. You're a blessed person just by being born here or coming here. You're a very blessed person. So it's important that we, we get our bearings right because we, 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 you know, we, 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 we're not sort of clearly thinking. I can tell you many other stories, um, stories about people in North Korea, what happens to them and how God himself teaches them. You know, God himself, the Holy Spirit teaches them. Now, normally God wants us to go to church. That's God's way. But when there is no church, God will teach you directly. 
See, we live, we live in extraordinary times in many ways, but getting back to the text, the text here, what I'm trying to do, I suppose, is trying to say that, that you know, really we've, we've got it easy. Really we, th- these people have faith in God. That priest became actually a spiritual father to this man who leads a very big organisation. And again, you see, he's got nothing to do with denomination because the guy who leads this organisation is an evangelical. But he recognised in that Romanian Orthodox priest that Christ was present in him. Christ was present in him. So going back to the text, when Jesus comes... When Jesus is present, things happen. That man, because he prayed, because he loved those people, Jesus was present and brought conviction to that man who was a nine-time murderer. That's what the power of God can do. The power of God has the ability to change us, the ability to do things that we cannot do, the ability to bring what is, uh, what, what is uh, unseen into fruition. But, but we have to be open to the presence of God and to the love of God. Because if we're not, then we probably will miss out on what God wants to do in our life. So let's read on. Let's see here again Mark's Gospel. On, on leaving the synagogue, he went with James and John straight to the house of Simon and Andrew. Now Simon's mother-in-law had gone to bed with fever and they told him about her. He went to her, took her by the hand and helped her up. And the fever left her and she began to wait on them. Now here's, here's an example of what we're talking about this morning. This wasn't a big evil spirit. This was she was sick with some fever, some bug. But Jesus didn't make any distinction between the man who, was, who needed a big clean-up in the synagogue and the mother-in-law who was just sick, if you like, but incapacitated for the moment. There was no distinction. Jesus prayed for her and she was healed. So again, doesn't matter how small your problem is, God can heal you. Whether your problem is big or small, it doesn't matter. As we, as we navigate through the Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus is healing people and delivering people, whether it's a big thing or a small thing. There, there, were, there were so many things that weren't recorded here, it says in Scripture. There were so many things that Jesus did because it was his normal way of life. It was in his normal day. He just went about his business. He didn't have to go to the synagogue like he did go when he was supposed to go. As we, Jesus, by the way, kept everything he had to do in the Jewish. He didn't miss going to the synagogue. He didn't miss going to... He, didn't, he did everything he was supposed to do. Okay? But, but on the other hand, he took church, synagogue, out to the people and he ministered to the people. So he ministered whether it was in the synagogue, in the prayer mountain, in the streets, Jesus was open to ministering. Jesus was opening to bringing healing to people. And again, if we read on, um, it says, uh, that evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed by devils. The whole town came crowding round the door and he cured many who are suffering from diseases of one kind or another. See, there's no distinction here. This is, this is what I'm trying to get at today uh, because normally we can talk about big things. But I'm talking about any condition. God wants to heal you. The whole town came crowding around the door and he cured many who were suffering from diseases of one kind or another. He also cast out many devils, but he would not allow them to speak 
because they knew who he was. You see, the devils know who Jesus is. Sometimes human beings can't tell, but the, all the devils know. But many human beings cannot identify who Jesus is. In the morning, long before dawn, he got up and left the house and he went to a lonely place and prayed there. Now, brothers and sisters, again, it's very important that we are people of prayer. Now, there's, okay, if you're, if you're not praying, there's no condemnation, but you'll never ever be able to be strong in the spiritual life if you do not have a prayer life. Coming here on Sunday is great, but it will not sustain your spiritual life. You need to have a, you need to have a spiritual life where time is allocated every day if possible to God. We allocate... I do. We're very good at allocating times to eat, aren't we? We eat in the morning. Uh, we eat, well, there was actually um, a, a, a person I knew who actually came to Australia as a, as a missionary and when they asked him what he liked about Australia, he said, I like Australia a lot because you have morning and afternoon tea here. <laughs> so... He liked it. He was getting five meals a day, <laughs> or three. And so we know when we we know we know that we have to eat. We make time for that. In fact, one person I think it could have been Derek Prince made a joke that most of the pastors know where the best restaurants are in town. Okay, so we know where, when, and where to eat, but. What about our spiritual life? How many times a day do you pray? And this is where we're good with this Benedict option is because what rhythm of life are you conscious of God? You make conscious time for God during the day at any time. And the tragedy is some of us don't make any time which is a recipe for eventual spiritual death. So it is, it is an important thing. Jesus here, after all that he did, he didn't, go on a, he didn't go to the local bar to switch off and have a couple of wines. He went to pray. When you come home and you stress... Don't go to the bar if possible. Go to your room and pray. That's what Jesus did. So he, he does all this and then he goes to pray. And it's very important that we don't forget how important this is. And, you know, in this time of uh, holidays, uh, I think Bob Jones said this, there's the least amount of prayer and spiritual activity in the church because people tend to be on holidays. But I remember very clearly, I had a very good, I had a, a, a brother who taught me and he used to say, you can never afford to have a spiritual holiday. And he drummed that into us and I never, I've never forgotten that because that, that's kept me... Uh, kept me going, particularly when I have been on holidays. I've always made actually more time to pray rather than less time to pray. You see? So these, are very, these are very important spiritual principles. But if we get caught up in the Western culture, we, we, we lose what God, what the Word of God says and what the Word of God, what the way the Word of God wants us to live. Because we get caught up in the culture. So Jesus goes and he prays. And he, um, uh, it says, he, long before dawn. Because there's a tradition in the, in the church that goes back to, the, to Jesus himself in the Bible. Where people get up early before dawn to pray. 
Okay, now you might say, oh, I'm not a morning person. That's fine. You, as long as you pray, uh, pray. But this is a tradition that Jesus started. So long before dawn, he got up and left the house and went off to a lonely place and prayed there. Simon and his companions set out in search of him. And, the, and, and when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. He answered, let us go elsewhere to the neighbouring country towns so I can preach there as well. And he went through all the gallery, preaches in their synagogue and casting out devils. So Jesus, uh, um, the, 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 you see, the, the signs and wonders are not an end in themselves. That's why they're called signs and wonders because they're supposed to point to Christ. And the important thing for Jesus wasn't the sign and wonder, it was the preaching of the gospel. Which goes to my second point. Are we preaching the gospel? Or are we just interested in signs and wonders and prophecy? Because the purpose of those things is to preach the gospel. So if we're not preaching the gospel and we're concentrating on those things in themselves, then that is not a good recipe. <coughs> because the purpose of them is supposed to lead people to Christ. That's the, that's the issue. And see, Jesus, is, he, he teaches us everything. But it's in the book. And if we don't read the book, we won't know. Okay, so... Read the book as well for prayer because it's helpful. I'm amazed at, you know, how much. Like, it's a, this, this is an incredible book, what Jesus teaches us here. And, you know, again, if you look at the persecuted church, if they get one page of this, some of them, one page, they will, they will you know, it's like a million dollars because that's all they have. I've probably got about 50 translations at home. Might be called spiritual gluttony. <laughs> um, but it's important to read it. That's the important thing. So how are we going so far? Was, we're going to pray with you this morning. I'm going to pray and I'm going to get some help from not only the leaders, but the healing rooms and many others. Ministry leaders, I want you to help us pray. Um, and we, well, Perhaps we might pray over you first, then you can pray over the others. Anyway, I'll just go a little bit longer. Just to prove my, to hopefully prove the point. So verse 40 of chapter 1. A leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling, said to him, I, if you will, you can make me clean. <coughs> now move with pity or compassion. The other translation here says sorry. But this is, this is a word that from Greek which indicates a movement from the innermost part of a person's being, right from their bowels. It, 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 it can be translated compassion, it can be translated love, but it's not just pity or sorrow for someone, but a real empathy with someone. And so again, the other thing that's missing when people pray is there is not the love of God. There's not, we, we can pray, we can prophesy, but it can have no love in it. And you know, God's ultimate intention is love. That's why he says, make love your aim in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Make love your aim or make love your goal. Now, that's not ex exclusive of the gifts. It's inclusive of the gifts. But the gifts have to be exercised in love. And when they're not exercised in love, they turn people off rather than bringing them to the gospel. So... Jesus, this leper comes to him and it wasn't just a matter of healing him. Jesus had compassion 
for him. He had compassion. Now, compassion can't be conjured up. But we can ask God to help us. And, you know, compassion comes to by suffering. If you've never suffered, okay, then you're probably not going to have a lot of compassion. Okay? So God sometimes allows suffering in our life so that he can make us a better person and a person that can have empathy with others. As John Wimber used to say, you can get the job done, that the operation was successful, but that the patient died in the process. So we don't want successful operations and people dying in the process. We want people to have life, the true life of Jesus Christ in the process. So Jesus has compassion. He stretches out his hand and he heals him. And Jesus says this, which again, um, people say, well, God may not want... He says, the response was, of course I want to. That's in the Jerusalem translation. And in, in the other translation here, it says, um, let me see. And immediately the leopard left him and he made him clean. Jesus, and it doesn't really give up. But the, 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 um, the thing is that the question was, if you want, if you can, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with pity, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So Jesus wants to heal. He wants to do it in compassion. And he does bring results. Now, I can go on with this guy because this, this is a great teaching on healing. Because healing is not just about getting a person healed. It's about having empathy. It's about preaching the word. It's about um, um, someone exercising faith. Now, maybe it's not the person who's getting prayer. But there's got to be some faith somewhere. There was a man in, in chapter 2, the next, the next story. These are all stories about healing in Mark's gospel, one after the other. So in the next story... There's a man gets lowered through the roof, okay? Now, he had no faith at all, okay? But the guys that lowered him had faith. So we don't condemn people and say you don't have faith. That's awful when you say that to a person. But someone somewhere has to have faith along the road because it also says in Scripture, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Jesus then heals the other man. But he also associates unconfessed sin with his condition. The man that was lowered through the roof. Now, there are 101 reasons why we're sick and 101 reasons why we're not healed and all that. And sometimes, well, that's just the way it is. God wants to take a person. And ultimately, we all have to go. But remember that Jesus has won. Jesus has triumphed over death and Hades. So for, for everyone else that's not a believer, they have no victory over death and they have no different victory over Hades. The Christian has victory over those last two enemies Amen. of human beings. And that in itself is enough to rejoice and dance all day. Amen. That's a wonderful message in itself. Praise God. So we've got a lot to be thankful for. We are a blessed people. But just quickly now, there's nothing that God cannot set you free from. And we want to just, you know, it's Christmas and probably you thought I might give a talk on, you know, something like that. But this is the best Christmas present you can get. Amen. Okay. Amen. <laughs>